Everybody, I want to welcome you to our Wednesday noon Bible study here at First United Methodist Church at the corner of Broad and Kirkman in downtown Lake Charles. I'm Weldon Barres. And I'm Katie Black. And we're the pastors here and so happy to be doing the Bible study and to welcome you to join us. I want to give a special shout out and welcome to Laura and her co workers at Memorial Hospital. They um, join us each week and watch the Bible study and, and really appreciate them doing that. And welcome to all of you. Um, as you're watching the study today, as we say each week, uh, if you have some comments you want to share with us or some questions, please do so. Katie, remind them how to, how to do that. So if you're on Facebook, go ahead and just put in a comment. And I've got about a 10 to 15 second delay, so I might not see it right away. But if you're on Facebook, you can go into the comment section. Some of you say, hi, welcome, good to see everybody. That's the same spot to go ahead and send in a comment. And uh, we try and interact a little bit through, through this study. So questions, comments, insights, because we learn more from you than sometimes any, anything. We get a lot of depth out of what you say. And it helps us out a lot. It helps oh, yeah. us in, in the thinking process and then explore some things that we might not have explored otherwise. Our scripture for today, if you want to get your Bible and look at it ahead of time and have it marked, is John chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. And each week we do the New King James Version of the Bible. So John chapter 3, verses 1 through 17, this is a story of Jesus and Nicodemus. Um, Katie, what announcements do you have for us as we begin? So right after this at 1 o'clock, Tony James is going to be doing some singspiration. So stick around right at 1 o'clock. He'll be right here in the worship Our center. Our own Tony James. Our own Tony James. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, this is our first Sunday. June 7th will be our first Sunday back for live, in-person worship here in the Worship Center. We are really looking forward we're to so, it. We're so excited. We want to see everybody, and we want to hug you and do all that. We won't do that yet. 
but we'll have four services going on. It's going to be at 8.30 and 9.30 are the, con the contemporary services, and then 10.30 and 11.30 are going to be our traditional services. And all four services are going to be right here in the worship center. Right, right. And as you're coming to worship, bring a mask. We'll all be wearing a mask during worship service, and uh, we're going to be practicing good social distancing and good hygiene while we're here to keep at this worship space as safe for you and us and for everyone that we meet. Each service is going to last 45 minutes. Um, and we're just really looking forward to being together. I've had people ask me, can we sing in church? And the answer is yes, we can sing. Uh, and as Katie said, you'll be wearing a mask. So that the advantage of that is <laughs> you can yawn and, and no one's going to see. Um, I, I won't see, Katie won't see. In, in fact, you can, you can talk to your, your you can, neighbor. You can get some whispering done. And, and no one's going to see. Well, so. you got to whisper loud to get those six feet across. Well, that's true. <laughs> yeah. Oh. So there's some advantages to Still wearing a mask. can't sleep. And you can't sleep. We will see those eyes <laughs> if you do. Um, Katie's going to lead us in a word of prayer as we begin. Gracious God, we thank you for this opportunity to gather for this opportunity to pause, to look on your word. Gracious God, open it up to us. May we understand and may we know your love and your compassion, what your word has to teach for us this day. Open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to your love. We ask all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught all of his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, our Father who, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come. come. Thine will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our topic today is Jesus and Nicodemus, John chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. You ready? Katie, okay, you ready? Let's do it. All right, here we go. I'm going to read verses uh, 1 through 9, and then Katie's going to read 10 through 17. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do these things that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, You must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes. And you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, if you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So in the Gospel of John, we meet for the first time a man named Nicodemus. Nicodemus. You know anybody named Nicodemus? I don't know anyone named Nicodemus. I know some. I know a Nikolai. We know a Nikolai. Mm -hmm. Nikolai is the man. Yes, indeed. I've I've know I've met a Nico before. Nico. Uh -huh. a Nico. Mm -hmm. Uh, never a Nicodemus. I have a nephew, Nicholas, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I do not know a Nicodemus. That, that's right. interesting. So for the first time in the scriptures, we meet Nicodemus. Now, he's referred to not at all in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Right. But we find him in the Gospel of John three different three times. Three different times, yeah. 
The first time is one that we just read, mm -hmm. John chapter 3. Um, the second one, and we'll tell you the, the three scripture passages so you can look them up or follow along with us. John chapter 7, verses 45 through 51, mm -hmm. and then John 19, 39 through 42. Right. So the, this first one in John 3 is kind of the big moment, and then there's two other appearances that we see of him. So this is from John chapter 7, verses 45 through 50. And this is uh, the Pharisees talking about Jesus. Then the officers came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, Why have you not brought him, meaning Jesus? The officers answered, No man ever spoke like this man. Then the Pharisees answered them, Are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Nicodemus, he who came to Jesus by night, being one of them, said to them, Does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he's doing? Mm. Okay, so later on in the story of Jesus, mm -hmm. in the Passion days, the days mm -hmm. of the Passion, he speaks up in right. defense of Jesus. Right, because the, the, the crowd is stirring and the controversy, and they're saying, yeah. what, what is wrong with this man? And, he's, and they're saying, no, no one who's religious believes in him. And Nicodemus says, Whoa, wait have, a you, minute. have yep. you heard this? Mm -hmm. Do we not hear someone out before mm -hmm. we just make accusations? Mm -hmm. Then the third time he's mentioned is in the Gospel of John, chapter 19, uh, verse 39, and a few verses following. And Nicodemus, who had first came to Jesus by night, also came, this is after the death of Jesus, mm -hmm. also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. Then they took the body of Jesus, bound it in strips of linen with the spices, as the custom of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified was a garden, in the garden a new tomb in which no one had ever seen. So there they laid Jesus. Uh, so we see him three times mm. in the Gospel of John. And I think Nicodemus is such an interesting character, and I need your help at home with this because I can't get a peg on him. I want to figure out, is he a courageous man or is he a coward? And I feel like I've got a good argument for both. But he's such an intriguing character because... We're going to talk about in a few minutes, he comes to Jesus for the first time at night. Mm -hmm. But this isn't the last time he sees Jesus. He kind of does speak up for him mm -hmm. when, the, when, the, when the water's getting a little bit hot mm -hmm. and he says something. He doesn't start throwing over tables, but he speaks up. And then he kind of shows up at the burial. Mm -hmm. and, and he's the one bringing, you know, it says hundreds of pounds of spices yeah. to kind of lay on his body. Are we seeing an evolution mm -hmm. in the character and belief of yeah. Nicodemus, uh, or is this a different side of him? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, is yeah. he a coward, is he or is he courageous? Courageous, or is it something that's melding in our hearts? Because I think most of our lives we're probably somewhere in between those two. I don't think we're ever at our. I don't think we're ever at peak Peter of just leading the charge, and we're probably not always hiding in the back room. I think most of our lives we spend somewhere in between those spaces. Peak Peter. Peak Peter. I like that. <laughs> that, that's, that I'll, I'll, I'm going to go ahead and uh, you ought to trademark like that. that. Yeah. yeah. Peak, Peak Peter. Peter. That'd be a good sermon topic. <laughs> Peak Peter. That's good. Um, okay. Chapter 3, verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. A man of the Pharisees. Now, as we read the New Testament, we read about the Pharisees mm -hmm. uh, a lot. And um, a lot of Church-going folks um, have no idea who the Pharisees were. We, mm -hmm. we, we hear the name, we say the name, yeah. but who were the Pharisees? Because mm -hmm. they come up a lot and usually not in the best light. Usually not in the best light. Mm -hmm. um, you have something from um, the, the trusty from the World, World Book. Book Encyclopedia. Yes. And uh, I've said this before. I, I like hearing like what Encyclopedia Britannica says or World Book says because it's kind of a, a, a secular Mm -hmm. definition for right. us of things. Right. It says, the Pharisees were members of an ancient Jewish group that became an important political party in Palestine during the, queen, the reign of Queen Alexandra from 76 to 67, and their role ended under the reign of Herod the Great around 37 to 4 BC. And it also says that in the Gospels, the Pharisees were not politicians or philosophers, but they were Jews who stressed the laws of dietary purity. According to the Gospels, they ate only with pure Jews, while Jesus and his disciples ate with people who didn't keep the law. As the Pharisees stressed the washing of the hands, the early Christians ignored this. The Pharisees fasted, but Jesus and his disciples didn't. The Gospels also often portrayed the Pharisees as the main Jewish opponents of Jesus, who easily overcame their opposition. 
It also says the Pharisees were often in conflict with other Jewish groups called the Sadducees, and they had a lot of disagreements revolving around the issues of purity. The Pharisees believed that purity laws should be kept by all Jews and were not limited to the priests. The Pharisees believed that all Jews should eat as if they were priests presiding at the altar of the temple. Interesting. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, there are 600 laws mm -hmm. in the Torah, and right. the Pharisees felt it was their duty and their calling to uphold these 600 laws of the Torah. Right, and they also kind of were the people who would interpret them a little bit. So if there was a situation that they were saying, you know, you can't work on the Sabbath unless your ox falls into a hole and you need it to save its life, and then they're going to, a couple hundred years later and they say, what if it's a donkey? And so they would say, okay, so this means this scripture mm -hmm. is here and this is okay and this is not. So they were kind of the interpreters too. Interpreters and updating mm -hmm. and, and that kind of thing. Um, did John the Baptist like the Pharisees? Ooh, no. Not too much. They clashed a little bit. And Jesus had some kind of harsh comments about mm -hmm. them too. Um, we're going to share two scripture passages with you with this. One is uh, Matthew chapter 3, verse 7, mm -hmm. and then uh, Matthew 23, 15. Okay, so Matthew chapter 3, verse 7. It's, and this is about John the Baptist. It says, When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to this baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Brood of Brood vipers. Brood of vipers. Not very friendly mm -hmm. and, and welcoming. No, and, uh, like that son of a snake. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. John, John the Baptist, John the Baptizer, called um, a spade a spade. Yes. And so he pointed to the Pharisees, and boy, he, he called them out. Uh, this words of Jesus, Matthew 23, 15. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel land and sea to win one proselyte, and when he is one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as you yourselves. So, <laughs> wow. Um, Pharisees were not high on their... Mm -hmm. That's true. Okay. So, one thing that we're also going to notice is this man named Nicodemus, he comes to Jesus at night. And so, we're looking at this question of why. Why came at night? Why mm -hmm. this Pharisee um, came at night? Um, that's at the very beginning in, in chapter 3. Um, look at it again. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, the ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher sent from God and so forth. The question is, why did he come at night? Um, so at home, I really want you to think about this. Uh, kind of struggle with it. Maybe Katie and I are making it more of a big deal than what it actually is, but I, I think that things are in Scripture for a reason. Mm -hmm. And it said he came at night. Why at night? Um, think about it, and then we're going to give you our theories. Mm -hmm. Let's give them a minute. Yeah. See if we get any bites. We're baiting right. the hook. And see we're what happens throwing in. it in the pond. Yeah. Uh, okay, I just have a feeling we're getting a bite. Yeah. We get one? Not not yet. But while we're waiting, let's talk about the Sanhedrin a little bit. Okay. Uh, so we know that Nicodemus was a member of the, that he was a Pharisee, but he was also a member of this ruling class called the Sanhedrin. And they were, what, about 71? 71 mm -hmm. um, members of the Sanhedrin. Right. And so that meant that they were basically kind of their version of the Supreme Court. And so they would have a lot of power and a lot of ruling power. Yeah, you got the Pharisees, kind of a, a big group. Big umbrella. And then the ruling council, mm -hmm. the judicial council of, of them, 71, right. the Sanhedrin. Right. You had the scribes mm -hmm. also, they kept the notes. notes. And th there was one other the political party. The zealots. The zealots. Mm -hmm. So um, this will be on, on your test. You got the, uh, the Pharisees, the scribes, uh, the Sadducees. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, yeah. They didn't believe in the resurrection. Did not believe in the resurrection. Um, the Zealots, the Sanhedrin, all these parties, they were all together for the most part, but then they had different emphasis. Right, and so they would have some power struggles. So we've got a couple of comments now that we're kind of talked a little mm -hmm. bit about that. Um, we've got a couple of people who are saying, Don Clement says he doesn't want to be seen. This ah, is why he might good. be coming at uh -huh. night. And Eileen agrees. She says that it was in secret. Ah, okay. Yeah. Good answers. All right. Like that. Let's put a positive note in their files. Right, right. We'll right. get them out. These are some of our theories. What's, what's the first one that we came up with? So one that I think he might just be busy. So who, who he? 
Well, both he. Uh-huh. Uh, so Nicodemus is a busy guy. He's a, mem he's a Pharisee. He's a member of the Sanhedrin. He probably got another side work. He might have a family. How much time does he have in his day? And then on the other hand, you also have Jesus, who is turning water into wine, who is, you know, throwing, going into the temple and preaching and doing all of these things. Yeah. He's, he's a busy Leading guy. up to the story, right. in John chapter 2, he turns water into wine at Cana. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of chapter 2, he goes to the temple in Jerusalem where he turns over the tables right. and it just this big scene mm -hmm. takes place. And so then this is the next scene. So Jesus is also a busy guy. And so it could be that this might be the only time that you can carve out in their schedules to sit down together. Okay, that, that's a very plausible answer is that Jesus was very busy. Nicodemus being on the Sanhedrin mm -hmm. was a busy guy, so he had to come at night. Mm -hmm. Ooh, uh, I've, I've got one. Uh, Terry says, it was a conversation only to be shared with him like our personal relationship with Jesus. Mm, okay, he didn't want other people hearing about it. Mm -hmm. So Terry says it was very personal. personal. Okay, that's a, a real mm -hmm. good thought. And one mm -hmm. more from Eileen, or it's actually from Roger, said that he didn't want the other Pharisees to see him. Ah, yeah, yeah, because the Pharisees clearly were not believers in Jesus. Yeah. And it seems like Nicodemus was open-minded to mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Uh, so he's exploring it, and he didn't want them to right. do it. And that leads us to our second theory. Right. And, and that was, is, he was scared. He was scared. Yeah, he didn't want the, exactly what Roger said. He didn't want the other Pharisees mm -hmm. to know that he was even talking to Jesus. Right, right. And this is a risk that he's taking. He's a political power, and as with anybody who's in the crowd a lot, you're going to have people who disagree with what you do. Mm -hmm. And so he has to play his cards well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. A, a third possible reason? He's ashamed. He's, he's a little bit, and he might be ashamed to be seen by others. He might be a little bit embarrassed by that. He might not want to have other people see them, like you were saying uh, online. He might not want to be these things, invisible things. He might not know where he stands. Yes. And so I think he might be a little bit ashamed of what he does know and doesn't know because he goes to Jesus to ask questions when he's supposed to be the person who has the answers. Yeah. Yeah. So I think there's there's a little bit of ashamed. Yeah, that, that's really good. He goes to Jesus to ask questions when he's supposed to be the one giving the answers. Mm -hmm. that, that's a, a real good observation. Um, it, it could be, and you had mentioned this before the study when we were kind of brainstorming things, that um, Jesus had this crowd of people around him all the time mm -hmm. who weren't really popular folks. We're talking... You're not supposed to be around these people. Yeah. Uh, tax collectors. Mm -hmm. Sinners. Sinners. Um, prostitutes. People with leprosy. Um, unclean people. And it could be that Nicodemus just didn't want to be rubbing elbows with this crowd. Yeah. At least not seen as such mm -hmm. during the day. Yeah. So he goes at night. To be a little bit more protected in that way. Yeah. It could be, mm -hmm. and more than likely... Nicodemus just wanted some quality one-on-one -on -one time with Jesus. And there's, it's hard to do that. There's not too many stories in this Bible of one-on-one -on -one conversations. You have this moment with Nicodemus. You have the woman at the well. But a lot of these times, there's, this, there's always a crowd watching. Yeah, yeah. Um, Zacchaeus, we mm -hmm. had talked about before right. we, we started. Uh, Zacchaeus, in the midst of a crowd, of Jesus a crowd. called him down mm -hmm. and spent one-on-one -on -one time with yeah. him. Yeah, and Nicodemus seeks him out one-on-one. -on -one. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And in the one-on-one, -on -one, mm -hmm. you can ask the questions, you can follow up on the question, you can pursue. And Nicodemus apparently was really serious mm -hmm. about wanting to know who this man is. And just sitting in a crowd of people and hearing him teach wasn't going to answer it. He wanted to, to ask questions and follow up on the question. Get a follow-up question and get dialogue back and forth. That's true. Then we come to something pretty profound with this. So another answer, another reason, is it might be a little bit of a figurative reason of he came to him when it was at night within his own self, that he might have been dealing with a struggle, that it might have been literally at night, but he might have been going through a dark night of the soul. Right. And it, it could be figurative language in addition to literal language. It was a dark night of the soul. In the same way at the Last Supper, when Judas was betraying Jesus, it says he left and it was night. And it was night, but it was night in the soul of Judas. Maybe 
Nicodemus was really struggling with something, with many things. Uh, so oh, he absolutely. came to Jesus at night. Um, anytime I read this story, I, I, I can't help. I ask myself, poor Jesus, um, <laughs> was he tired? Was he worn out? Was he ready to go to bed? Yeah. Was he kicking up his feet and then, mm-hmm. hey, I want to have this deep theological discussion with <laughs> yeah. you. And I think he, he's got to be tired. I mean, you just said he just went through the temple and kind of caused this big scene of throwing tables. I mean, works up an appetite and works, yeah. up, works up a nice nap. Yeah. And I'll bet he was ready to sleep. But in spite of that. He makes time. He makes time. He welcomes Nicodemus in and they have this amazing conversation. Uh, and, and we'll talk about that in, in just a minute. Let's continue by uh, laser focusing on um, two and three. So chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He calls Jesus Rabbi. Mm -hmm. So he gives him a title. Rabbi, as we know, teacher means teacher. So he's saying um, teacher. He, He treats Jesus with respect, Mm -hmm. a lot of respect, Uh, rabbi, and then he he affirms things about Jesus. We know that you're a teacher come from God because we've seen these things that you do. The generous use of we, considering he seems to be alone in that stance. Yeah, that's that's a really good question and observation. Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher from God. Uh, According to what we're reading, it's Nicodemus and Jesus, but yet he says we. Mm -hmm. So the question is, Who is we? Mm -hmm. I think he means the other Pharisees and perhaps some of the Sanhedrin. They know what Jesus is doing. They don't like it, Mm -hmm. but they recognize that he has power that they don't have. So I think there is some sort of at least begrudging admittal on Mm -hmm. some people's part, Mm -hmm. even though they won't say that in public. The answer of Jesus, um, most assuredly, Mm -hmm. um, not like, uh, well, I, I think... Possibly. Possibly it could be. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So the answer of Jesus is saying, I'm telling you the truth. You must be born again to see the kingdom of God. Let's continue with the the follow-up question of Nicodemus, verse 4. It says, Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? So Nicodemus is taking this very literally. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, you must be born again. And Nicodemus is saying, wait, how how can this be? How can you enter into your mother's womb again? And I think he's doing exactly right because I I know I've been in that classroom where somebody, the teacher says something that goes over everybody's head and everybody's just going, okay. But there's that one person who says, hang on. Yeah. Are you saying that we need to physically go up into a womb, expand on this, I don't understand. Please help me. And that's why he wanted this one-on-one time with Jesus. So he could raise his question and raise his hand and ask the question. Um, Way too often when I'm in the classroom or in the seminar or something like that, I'm thinking the question, I want to ask it, but I'm too chicken. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. And I don't ask it. Yeah, I'm I'm the same way. I'm always so thankful for that person who does raise the hand. And so this maybe is going for courage on that one. Yeah. Okay, let's continue. Um, Five through eight. Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. That's a scripture for Sunday, by the way, Mm -hmm. the the blowing in the wind. Yeah. Um, Jesus said, don't marvel what I'm saying to you. You must be born again. So we come to the question that we just have to ask. Jesus said it three times here. You must be born again. An imperative. You must be born again. The question is, what does it mean to be born again? Nicodemus didn't get it. But I think when it was all said and done, he got it. Yeah. But today, year 2020, what's it mean? So I think especially in the context of this conversation, Nicodemus is saying, do I need to go back up into a womb? And Jesus says, no, you are born in that womb. 
and you come into this world, it is a gift from God, and you are loved from God since before you were born. And that love has been gifted to you. What he is saying is you must be born of the Spirit, which is that moment in which you accept God's love for yourself, that that love that God has poured down on you is not a one-way street anymore, that you send it back up, that you say, God is the love of my life, and I will do what it takes to be a follower of God. You make that conscious decision Mm -hmm. to accept God's love. Mm -hmm. To accept that spirit, Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. To accept that spirit. And I I would add to that, um, to be born again is to accept it, and then God's love, God's grace transforms us, and we change, and we become different people. We were heading this direction but the Lord's grace and mercy changes us to a different direction. And it's like we're, we're born again. We're, we're new people. Given a clean slate. A clean slate. Our sins are forgiven. We have a, a second chance in life because we've accepted the grace of God. Um, to me, that's what it means to be born again. Um, it's a little bit before your time, but um, when Jimmy Carter ran for president in mm-hmm. 1976, that was his thing. He said, I, I'm a born-again Christian. I think it's kind of redundant. Uh, all Christians should be, <laughs> be born, born again. again. Yeah. But uh, that was a, an issue. And I'm, I'm glad, not an issue, but it was something that, that they he talked was, about. He, was, he brought to the mm-hmm. forefront. Yeah. I was always grateful for that. Um, so at home, um, ask yourself the question. What does it mean when Jesus said you must be born again? That's such an important question to ask because we have to to, to, to have that happen in our lives because Jesus said you must be born again. Mm -hmm. And so Nicodemus answers, and it says Nicodemus answers, and then it gives a question again, which I I love. He he answers with a question. In verse 9, Nicodemus answered and said to him, how can these things be? I love that. I love that Uh, (laughs) because... I say that a lot. Um, (laughs) I I read scripture. I see the hand of God in things and I say, how can these things be? And sometimes people come to us and say, I have a question about this. And I've said it more than once. I don't know. I do not have an answer. I say it a lot. Yeah. I I don't know. (laughs) I want to. Yeah. But I I don't have an answer. And but I had to learn kind of the hard way that it's okay not to have an answer, that some there are some questions that don't have answers, and that's an okay answer to give, and also it's a biblical one. Yes. So uh, if you're following along, if you want to flip to Isaiah chapter 55, uh, and I'm going to be reading from verses 8 and 9. So uh, I, Isaiah 55, mm-hmm. 8 and 9. 8 and 9. Okay. It says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Mm. Yeah, that our little brains <laughs> just cannot comprehend mm-hmm. the incredible majesty and the mystery of God. We, we just can't. And the little bit that we do understand is because God has revealed it to us. And just by the grace of God, we can know some things. Yes. But if we don't know, it's okay. You do, and it doesn't mean you have to stop searching. But it does mean that when you don't know something, it's okay. It's okay. His question is valid. Mm -hmm. How can these things be? How can it be? Okay, time is getting us. Um, I want us to jump to verses 14 through 17. Okay, let's do it. Okay, so verse 14 says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Probably the most well-known verse in all the Bible, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. The Mm -hmm. thing that that so blows me away about this is, is that statement was made possibly to one person. Right, right. So this isn't the Sermon on the Mount or feeding of the 5,000, this is a one-on-one conversation. One-on-one. You know, sometimes, and Katie and I were talking about this a minute ago, sometimes preachers get, um, not just preachers, but especially preachers, get hung up on 
crowds. Mm -hmm. uh, if we have a church full, mm -hmm. we feel like, well, we're doing something, you know, that mm -hmm. needs to be. And if it's a small crowd, oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. Or I mean, we post on social media and we look for how many how many yeah. likes did we right, get, and, right, right, and get a little bit of a, a yeah. jolt from that. And, and the thing that that we need to remind ourselves, and any time that we witness to someone, is focus on that one person. Mm -hmm. What I try to tell myself when I preach on Sunday, whether there's a big crowd or a little crowd, there's somebody there who really needs to hear this word from God. And God can touch, even if it's just one person, that is worth it. Any amount of work that we put in, the prayer, the, the discernment, the, the struggle that we put into those moments of ministering, the failures that we have become worth it when one person has a light bulb moment. Definitely. So one of the greatest sermons ever preached mm -hmm. to one person. Um, something that, that I think about every time I read this, you have Nicodemus making a special trip to see Jesus at night to talk to him one-on-one. -on -one. Um, Katie, and at home, and then I'll try to think of an answer too. If, um, if you had the opportunity to visit with Jesus one-on-one, -on -one, what would you ask him? What would you say? What would you do? All right, Katie, answer's yours. Here we go. Hot seat here. Um, I don't know right offhand. I, I think there are certain questions that I might come up with, but and partly in my life, and what am I doing right? What am I doing wrong? How can I do better? But I think essentially it's just what can I learn mm. from Jesus? Yeah, um, that is a hard question. It really is because, like, so I hope it, you're giving a good answer here. Yeah, we're gonna we'll see if yeah. they're gonna be sending it in. There's gonna yeah. be a stream of <laughs> answers here. Um, I, I don't know that I can think of something that I would want to ask Jesus because I, I don't know that I want to hear what the answer <laughs> would be. Sometimes, instead, I would just want to be like, um, like Mary, and just kind of sit down at the feet of Jesus and and listen, uh, absorb. His holy presence. But Nicodemus went loaded. Uh, right, he, he had right. Some he had questions and he yeah. was ready to ask them. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I remember I have a friend who always said, you know, the number one question, tell me about mosquitoes. <laughs> why? Yeah, why? <laughs> and so what, what's on that yeah. one? And I don't know that I have my, you know, answer ready, ready for the fire, ready to go. So I'm hoping that some of you might have, have a question. Uh, but Terry has a good comment from and talking about that being born again. She says, when we're baptized at an early age, it signifies that we're Christian. But as we grow older, we see the importance of God as we go through trials and troubles of life. Mm -hmm. Being born again is like that aha uh, moment. That's a good observation. Yeah. Any questions for Jesus? All or right. Did I'm, it stump them like I'm, it stumped it's me? Stumping. And it's stumping. It's stumping. Mm -hmm. Not seeing it yet. So, but think about it over this past week, and maybe next week, comment in mm -hmm. and let us know what. Think about what your one-on-one -on -one conversation might look like. Mm -hmm. The story of Jesus and Nicodemus. What an incredible story! Um, in the days to come, get out your Bible and read it again. Think about uh, each little phrase, each little sentence. Kind of put yourself in that story. Try to picture and imagine what it's like. Um, to me, it's one of the most amazing stories in Scripture. And Nicodemus, as we point out, he's going to pop up again two more times in the Gospel of John. So next week, we're going to look at a story from the Old Testament, and um, that'll be at 12 noon on Wednesday. And um, those of you who are able to come Sunday morning, we look forward to seeing you at 8.30, 9.30, 10.30, or 11.30. And those who can't, join us online. Um, we'll always be streaming online. Yes. Um, any other comments for today, Katie? Not seeing any up here, but I, I do want to just have a closing thought of I'm so thankful that Jesus opens the door even at night, mm. that, that it wasn't too late, it wasn't too tired, that he still makes time That's for, for, awesome. all, for Nicodemus and for us. We are never bothering Jesus, never. That's a good closing. Well, let's have a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for these moments that we've spent together this day reading your word and studying it and talking about it. Thank you that you are never too busy for us, even at night, even in a time that our soul is in the dark. Thank you for always being there for us. Bless each one who is joining us this day. In Christ's name, amen. Amen.
Thanks for joining us. Have a good week. God bless.